it. So good morning and welcome to We the People virtual. We're very excited today to see all of you and to have you join us and uh, some of our dignitaries and our um, local uh, public, public servants. Service. I'm going to call them public service. Some some are appointed, some are elected, but they're all in the public servant realm of the world. So we're really happy that you're here. Um, first, before I start, if you have any announcements you'd like to share with the group, I think what, what might be helpful today is if you put it in the chat. Or if you send it to me, I'll make sure it gets emailed to everyone if you have announcements. So hopefully um, that will work for you. We feel very um, honored today to talk about this topic, especially in the light of all the political stuff that's going on. Um, but to remember that we all play a part in the public service world. And we did send a tidbits out yesterday, a special tidbits out yesterday from Matt Landry. And so please consider trying to get yourself scheduled. They need the volunteers to do um, the testing for Genesee County. We're, we're going in the wrong direction. And I think our county, um, our county manager and the people uh, in the health world are trying to, to work on that and mitigate that and change that. My niece is the ER physician at UMMC. She's the head ER physician. And I you know, talked to her Sunday and she said, it's really, not, it's very bad. So uh, we all have to start making really good personal decisions and, and and protecting ourselves and everyone around us. So, Matt, as much as I want to schedule myself, my 96-year-old mom that I live with, I may not be able to. However, if we don't tell my daughter, I still might try. <laughs> she didn't want me to. So, um, we're going to, you know, hopefully look at today through the the eyes of a 21st century leadership in the perspective of being a visionary and helping the creative thinking process, um, learning from the past and examining the good, the bad, the different from the past, and then taking the best and going forward. So I hope that makes sense to you as you hear the speakers today. Um, you know, you have to envision the preferred future that you want. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process that many therapists use. They, they say, draw a mountain draw the top of the mountain and what you, you want that mountain to be and then the steps to get up that mountain to climb that mountain are how you maneuver your life to get to your goals so being in the public realm is very similar anything that's future oriented is similar so you know we have to vision that so that we um, take it forward uh, and try to make sure that we're doing the best we can for everyone um, our neighbors of all shapes, sizes, colors. So without further ado, um, I hope that you enjoyed our community health report day. We were very excited to be together. And you know what? We're together today and we're very excited about that too. So I would like to introduce you to our design team champion, Sue Gagne from the class of 05. And I'm going to hand it over to her. Hello, everybody. I see a lot of friends on there. So hi. <laughs> I wish we could be in person. We were, um, we had a great day originally planned for you, but we hope you get um, uh, just as much out of this day. Um, so like Peggy said, um, I'm Sue Gagne, and I'm just going to give you a little overview of what we have planned for you this morning. And um, part of that is um, reviewing the learning outcomes. And um, what we're hoping to uh, pass on to you today is an opportunity to interact with representatives from local government and examine their relationships and collaborations um, to discover the impact of criminal justice and government um, agencies on our community. Um, and we'll talk about the current challenges and opportunities facing our government and um, also discover uh, ways to demonstrate civic responsibility. So um, we have a great day planned for you. I'm super excited. Um, and uh, you'll hear from, we're supposed to introduce ourselves with what class we're from. And I will announce that I am from the best class ever, 2005. <laughs> You see Matt Lander smiling because he may or may not be from that class. And look where you end up. You never know where you'll end up. I remember when he was just a young fella. Now look at you, Matt. Way up top, you got that background. Okay, stop. Um, so 
Um, I So I work at Jacasa now. Um, I spent um, 16 years at the Mental Health Association and then I did some dual recovery work and now um, I am at Jacasa's recovery station out at the Old Bones, which um, unfortunately we just had to close our doors again on Monday, um, but I would love to have you guys down to check it out when we open. It's a um, great service to the community, I feel. Um, and we were asked to share a volunteer experience um, that we've had and um, how it made made us feel. And I had to think about it. I have, a, have several of them, but my most recent one was I uh, have a friend uh, in a school system who uh, works with seniors graduating and she um, has her students call every year and um, ask about uh, careers in human service. So I, that's my Specific, talking to um, teenagers who are so scared to ask questions and uh, she was super cute and she you could tell they're just reading from the um, um, you know the page like what do you like about your job but um, it was just for me it's really inspiring to see um, young people like explore um, different careers especially the human service field which you know I mean is, is pretty important to our community. So um, that was uh, my little thing. It's an easy, it's an easy way to um, volunteer too. And I know you guys are in all kinds of different um, roles. And I just think giving back, um, you know, some of the things you've learned is helpful to the young, um, young people. So, um, so instead of saying who wants to go next, um, I will just ask um, Kitty Martin, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Sue said, my name is Kitty Martin. And first, I just want to say I'm so happy to see so many of my former colleagues involved in this year's class. Hi, Mickey. <laughs> um, I'm the retired superintendent from Alexander. And um, prior to um, last March, I did a lot of volunteer work at Pembroke um, primary school where my grandchildren attend, but they won't let me in now. So that's out. Um, and I obviously do a little work with Leadership Genesee and I do a lot of work with um, Leadership Orleans. Orle um, I'm on the steering committee there. I was part of the um, committee that started the program there and I'm involved in several of their day sessions, the opening retreat, their closing retreat. Um, so I spend a lot of time there and um, I enjoy the opportunity for all of the contacts, which I missed from when I retired. Um, you know, when, when you're working in a school system, you spend a lot of time with people. And when you retire, you have to find other ways to spend a lot of time with people. So um, that's what I'm enjoying right now. Thank you, Kitty. Um, next up, Dave. I'm Dave Miller. I was a member of the class of 2006. Uh, presently, I'm retired, but it's a kind of semi-retired because uh, the 1st of January, I became the supervisor for the town of Alexander. On the side uh, here at home, we have a small uh, beef herd, roughly 70 animals that, that I care for by myself. Um, as far as the the volunteer um, opportunity, uh, when I was part of the class of 2006 and for government day, they suggested that we go visit a town uh, meeting. So I went and, and uh, participated in one of the town board meetings. And after that, I decided that that's something that I wanted to have more involvement with. So I talked to one of the board members and said if there was an opening, um, uh, I would be interested. Uh, soon after that, they had an opening on the planning board. And so I um, um, said that I, I would be interested and and I was accepted to that board. So that's 
for me was a very positive. Uh, it it kind of got me in the door as far as looking at what was happening in our town. And it, it was very informational in terms of, of that to see the new things and, and the things that, that people wanted to change or, or didn't want to change for the way things were going at that time. So that's pretty much it for me. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next, Kathy. You're muted though, Kath. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Kathy Uli. I'm program coordinator at Genesee Justice. Um, I've been here for 18 years, worked my way up, went back to school. Um, so now I'm the program coordinator. I'm from the class of 2017 of Leadership Genesee, the best class. Um, and I like to do uh, be active with LG, with I'm a, I'm a radar for the my class and also participating today. Uh, my church is very important to me and I'm a lector and Eucharistic minister at my church in Attica. Um, I'm very uh, impassioned about the rights of women. And so I'm also on the board and a member of the Zanta International Club in Batavia, which empowers women, gives scholarships to young women. Um, and along those lines as well, um, I'm on the board of All Babies Cherished where we give pregnancy assistance to women in need and men. Um, we have educational classes where they learn how to parent and things like that. And so those are the two important things in my life. I have three daughters, so I guess I'm uh, impassioned for the rights of women and um, I will work for that. So that's, uh, that's what I volunteer with. Thanks, Kat. Thank you. And Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I met most of you at the uh, Encouraging the Leader Within Day, but just for those who weren't a part of that day, uh, my name is Sarah Welker. I'm part of class of 2019. Ooh, ooh. Um, I was a probation officer for 13 years. And in the last two years, I've transferred over to being the treatment court coordinator for Batavia City Court and now Genesee County Treatment Court. So that is drug court, DWI court, mental health court, veterans court. Um, my volunteering, I am on the pond, which is Parents of Notre Dame Parent Teacher Association. I am on the board for the Justice for Children Child Advocacy Center. Um, and one of the experiences, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later, uh, volunteer experience for me that was important was volunteering with the Indian Falls Fire Department. And that was important to me partly because it's the town where I grew up and I was able to share that experience with my family, uh, my dad. So you'll be hearing a little bit more about that later today. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And um, Paul Siskowski from ARC, he's from the class of 14. Um, he's the director of operations at ARC in Genesee, uh, Orleans counties. Um, couldn't be with us, but he is part of our design team as well. So that's your introduction. And I just um, wish you guys, I hope you um, get a lot out of today. And I'm gonna turn it over, I believe to Kathy. Is that right? Or I don't know if Peggy's coming back. There she is, she's so cute. Okay. Okay, so today we have um, the county manager, Matt Landers, and our um, head of the legislators, Shelley Stein. We're gonna be talking to them about their roles in government, um, how, uh, what they see for the future in Genesee County, what they're experiencing now as we go through this, you know, changeable times. And, um, and I think I want to start off with Matt. Um, Matt was an assistant county manager for six years working with uh, county manager Jay Gazelle until he retired. And um, he just took over this past summer, this past August as county manager. Um, and through this uncertain time, I'm just asking Matt, what um, what your first feelings were as coming in as county manager at this time? What the hell am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely so, not uh, my ambition when I when I when I thought about taking this role a year or two ago. So 
uh, yeah, basically, what am I getting myself into? But uh, also excited of the challenges. And I know, you know, working with Jay all those years, you know, you were well versed in everything. But what was maybe um, besides the pandemic, what was kind of what Peggy would call your aha moment when you uh, took the reins yourself? Uh, probably shortly thereafter, just the volume of, of issues that, that I didn't realize that uh, Jay uh, did a good job addressing, but that, that went directly to him. Um, and and so basically, you know, the flood of, of everyone's got a problem, everyone's got an issue, and they looked to me to solve it. So that was kind of a, you know, wow. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer of a, a team approach. So, um, you know, my style and, and Jay, you know, was a great person to work under and, and learned a lot from Jay and, and one of the nicest people ever meet. But, uh, you know, I definitely am one that uh, I definitely need on my, my staff, on my department heads, and I'm trying to work in, in a very collaborative way moving forward, empowering board decisions at our department head level. And uh, that's probably one area that I've been uh, pushing out more. And you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, I, I never want to be the smartest person in the room, and I always bring the, the right people to the meetings uh, to help make the decision. So, uh, so the aha was pretty fast with all the questions and and, and the pandemic and the numbers uh, spiking pretty quickly on me. Um, but uh, you know, I've got an excellent team around me, so I've got an excellent. Okay, so um, I know the situation and, and the winter are coming. Um, we have many, many roads and bridges in our county. And I was astounded, I think, one manager's meeting when uh, the head of the highway department actually mentioned how many bridges that the county is responsible for. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about how those are maintained and um, what you see co going forward? I know money is tight. Money's always tight. And this year is no exception. Really tight. As far as the, the bridges, uh, Genesee County, it's it's uh, a little unique in Genesee County with the the bridges and the culverts that uh, that we take care of. Um, I just I double checked a little while back. There's 284 uh, culverts and smaller bridges of a span of between five and 20 feet, and then uh, the, the the bigger ones, the the full on 20 foot bridges. There's 95 of them in the county, uh, and Genesee County uh, is one of three counties in the state. That is responsible for maintaining these these bridges. So if you if you leave Genesee County and you're not in one of the other two counties that were crazy enough to take this responsibility on uh, decades and decades ago, uh, this is a city or a town or a village responsibility wherever that bridge uh, may lie. But in Genesee County, all of that infrastructure, those bridges, all fall onto the county. Uh, so this poses a challenge uh, for us to to maintain a, a hefty uh, workload of bridges uh, and disproportionate size to our to our county government and this has been something that's been a challenge that we've been uh, working on through the years um, trying to have the the right balance of funding um, it probably explains a little bit why our, our county property tax rates probably a little bit on the higher side when you compare us uh, to other counties around the state um, uh, that coupled with and, and historically how our, our sharing formula has been uh, has, has helped uh, uh, put us in a position that has been a challenge to maintain this this large infrastructure of bridges. Um, luckily, Tim Hens, um, I'm not sure, but I think he was one of the ones you're gonna have a tour with and he could probably speak volumes on, on information on our bridge network and, and the challenges he faces. Um, the towns have been great stewards recently, especially with, with helping us try to uh, go after as much federal and uh, state funding that is out there and, and being creative with us. Um, so I definitely don't wanna put this and, and, and put blame on the towns and villages, it's just the, the Matter of fact, the, the way that it is in Genesee County, um, and this goes back to something that was set up, I, I believe, you know, back in the 20s. It goes back many years of this formula of, of responsibility that, that Genesee County is responsible for. It's a tall lift to, to repair or to replace a bridge. It could be upwards of a million dollars plus to replace a bridge, which is a significant load on a county tax rate. Um, and, and, and so there is no desire at this point for us to turn around and, and be like the rest of the counties and put these million dollar bridges on the backs of our local towns and villages. Uh, but it's just something that uh, we would like to once in a while remind, remind people that this is an abnormal situation here in Genesee County and it's something that we've dealt with and will continue to deal with, but it's uh, it is a challenge. And uh, I know last year, which affected our, our department a lot was the uh, bail reform laws. 
to switching from gears completely. Um, yeah, I know our county was all set to move forward with a new jail and then bail reform came along and that wasn't, uh, that was encouraging to the, the new jail in some ways, but then we had COVID. So maybe you can update folks on where we stand right now or we don't stand with uh, getting a new jail and going forth from there. Yes, yeah, so the jail is on pause. Uh, it, the, the, there is so much uncertainty swirling around now. Um, I mean, we, we've gone from having our highest numbers ever in our jail back in July of 2019 to now we're at our lowest levels. And there's a series of factors that impact that. Most notably would be uh, bail reform. And then now there's reform to bail reform, which we still haven't fully uh, seen the effects of yet. And then the COVID, where we just haven't had the level of sentencing um, uh, that we had previously. So we have people that are awaiting sentencing. So, uh, so the project, you're right, Kathy, we were, the county was probably about three months away from bidding this project out. Uh, we were supposed to break ground in, in um, September of, of, this, of this year. So we were supposed to break ground a couple months ago. And uh, we were moving along. We had uh, an excellent engineering firm put together a uh, design of a 184 bed facility. Um, the facility was gonna be four pods and it was to serve a population of projected need of 143 individuals. Uh, so we had a study done a few years ago and uh, this, these, this firm, national firm, uh, they go, this is what they do. They go around and they look at uh, population trends. They look at, uh, they, they have a sit down conversation with, uh, with members of our criminal justice advisory committee everyone, all the stakeholders, and, uh, and they, they, they project what our jail population need would be 25 years out. They take into consideration things such as peak demand time, uh, maintenance of, of jail cells, uh, classification, because you can't have, uh, if you had 184 bed facility, you're not gonna fit 184 people in there. It's just impossible because of classification. Certain people can't be kept together. Um, so because of all those factors, 184 bed facility is meant to hold 143 people. Uh, with that in mind, in July of 2019, we had 143 people in our custody between our own Genesee County Jail, which was able to hold 97 people, uh, and then having to board out. And boarding out has been a significant cost in the last few years. Uh, so back in, in, in July of 19, I was actually fearful that we were building this jail too small, that we'd build this jail and we'd be boarding out day one, which was a, a major concern of mine. And then in the span of six months, yeah, um, because of the effects of bail reform, we were dropped down to around 60 uh, inmates. And all of a sudden now I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're building this thing too big. Um, and then we had COVID, which has dropped our population down in the 40s. So uh, because of the large swirling uncertainties, the Genesee County Legislature and Jay and myself, we all agreed that it, it was prudent to put this thing on hold. Um, the state has some leverage and they are the ones that are driving a lot of this conversation uh, because we do have an antiquated, um, outdated, uh, poorly designed jail that is just not conducive uh, to criminal justice in the 21st century. Uh, what they had been holding over our head is uh, our jail currently is designed for 87 beds. I said 97 a minute ago. It's designed for 87 beds, but there's a, a 10 bed variance that the state has been providing us for probably the last two decades. And they had clearly said that if we did not start the design work towards construction, that they would pull that 10 bed variance. So we were housing a lot of people out already. And that was going to basically force us to house 10 more inmates out every single day. And, and at extra, extra substantial cost, that coupled with the, the crumbling nature of our jail and the repairs that are coming up, it just, it just was obvious that this jail was, was a new jail was needed. Uh, we were building it, trying to build it as responsible as possible in a pod style a jail where you would basically have a, a pod where you have one uh, CO in the middle of the pod with eyes, direct supervision eyes all around, and you could fit up to um, around 60 individuals in one of these pods. But we weren't we were building that large. We were building a four pod jail and we were building the infrastructure of the jail such that the maintenance room, the, uh, the, the guts, the mechanicals, the, the kitchen, the laundry, everything was being built to scale to allow for a future expansion of four pods. Uh, so we were trying to build this so that it was not only going to be a jail for the next you know, 25, 30 years, but it was going to be a jail for hopefully another 100 years. Um, but given the fact that uh, our jail population is where it is and that the funding source that was going to pay for the jail was going to come from increase in sales tax, we at the same time, we had been we coupled a, a, an agreement with the city of Batavia. We were capping their sales tax growth from us and then uh, the amounts that we were going to be distributing 
uh, of revenue to towns and villages was also going to be frozen. And the growth in sales tax was going to cover debt service payments. And given the pandemic and the, and the COVID uh, virus uh, outbreak, uh, our sales tax has gone the other way. So we don't have that revenue source that we were going to pay for the jail debt service. Anymore. So all three of those factors, we have bail reform dropping our jail population, COVID dropping our jail population, and the funding source for the jail debt service drying up uh, caused us to have to put the entire project on hold. Um, we still have an outdated, antiquated, inefficient jail that needs to get replaced. Uh, and it's still going to be something that we move forward with, but uh, we're going to have to take a harder look and see what size we want to do this. We're also exploring the possibility of doing a joint jail with Orleans County. There's a lot of state laws on the books that, that prohibit that. And there's, there's also competing forces, political forces, sheriff association, uh, elected officials don't like giving up power. And uh, that's a, it's a reality we have to deal with as well is that we have to have, uh, um, we have to deal with. There's, there's gonna be some pushback on this process. We, we hope there's some, some state funding, matching money for, for a shared service project like a joint jail. Um, if we aren't able to pull off the joint jail with Orleans County, then there's also the option of housing and inmates from the ICE Federal Detention Center, and they do pay a decent amount of money. So we're looking to hopefully, even if we build this jail uh, to a scale that's a little bit larger than our current need, Again, we're trying to look 25 years out that there's other ways that we can maximize revenue to help offset our costs and, and make this as little of an impact a negative impact on the tax base. i know it's needed if anyone has ever had a chance to do a tour of the jail it's it's ancient and plus we can't house females so we have to house out all females they have to go to different jails and and we have to transport them back and forth and pay for them. So I know it's important, but right now we've got so much other <laughs> things going on. Yeah, um, I just want to emphasize enough that you're right, you're right. housing out of females is is also a matter of, of justice. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, why it is it is uh, largely unfair that if that, that that if you have a family member that's incarcerated and a male, that you can go ahead and you can visit your family member. But if you're if it's a female and you are potentially traveling, you know, two, three, four, five, six counties away. So it, that is also a matter of, of fairness and justice. And I can't emphasize enough. Yes, sir, there's a cost to having to out you know, the, to send all of our females out of county, but then there's also just a, a matter of fairness that comes with that as well. Okay, um, moving on, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the topic of the COVID um, and what's going on in the county. Um, can you give us all a, a big picture of how this is affecting the county? It, it, there's so many little threads to it, but um, what, what do you see overall as, as a, in a big picture of this? It's straining uh, resources. It's, it's wearing down uh, critical resources. And, and more, the most evident one is, is our health department. It, is, it, is, it has been a toll on them um, and, and they are working tirelessly our overtime lines are, are skyrocketing. They are working weekends. They are, um, and even with it, the, the tremendous effort they're putting forth, they're still behind on, on, on the numbers. There's just the, the, the rise in numbers is just more than we can deal with. We are bringing on contract nurses, uh, hiring part-timers. Uh, we are moving other members of county staff over there to help with contact tracing. Uh, but the sheer volume has just been crushing, and it's been uh, very exhausting and tiring on that on that on that entire public health department. Um, you know, they've been uh, going at it since March uh, tirelessly, and uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of the effort they put forth, and and Paul Pettit for the leadership he's provided over there. But um, and then throughout other county ranks as well, you know, law enforcement and the, the COs and the concerns of of keeping you know our, our the, the virus out of our jail. Uh, and, and, and all the extra precautions that we're putting up around. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we're stretched thin in, in every area. So it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of tiredness, but you know, we're not letting it affect the quality, uh, but uh, it definitely has been, it, it's putting other priorities on the back burner. That's been, uh, COVID has been our focus now for, for quite a while. Um, I'm, I'm heartened and hopeful that with a vaccine coming out and with, uh, I've been told that we should be receiving our first doses the coming week or two uh, won't be ready for distribution quite yet but that's that's the process they, they these companies get the doses out in the hands and then as soon as everything is approved and the plan is put out then we're in a position to quickly start um, 
uh, disseminating the, and vaccinating the, the appropriate populations. Um, so I just want to say one quick thing, Peggy led out with, um, I, I sent a request out and uh, Peggy, I think, and, and, and Vaughn, thanks for getting that out. Um, we are something lacking in our community. We've been doing a pretty good job uh, in Genesee County with symptomatic testing. So if you have symptoms, uh, and we, our first goal has been pushing out primary care providers to make sure you see your doctor. Most of them have the ability uh, to swab. Uh, you can also go to the hospital, you can go to urgent care, uh, but these are primarily sites that are for symptomatic testing. What we are lacking in our community is the asymptomatic testing. So uh, we are putting a, a clinic on uh, tomorrow uh, from one to four over at the fire training center. Uh, the press release just went out this morning. Um, and then we will be starting up a GCC uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays after that through December and through the first few weeks of, of January. The focus on that is, is again, asymptomatic. And there's two things, two benefits. One, we wanna start testing people that are um, that, that have been uh, either uh, under quarantine because of a close contact, but they don't have symptoms. It's good to start isolating and, and finding out if some of these people are positive um, so that they're not spreading it uh, as asymptomatic spreaders. Uh, but at the same time, our number, our testing is, is down. This is, this is hurting a rural county like Genesee County that is that has our rate is through the roof. It is, it is, it is, it is appalling. Uh, we're at over 8% positivity rate. Um, and is, I, I personally believe a lot of that's inflated because we, we do a good job testing, but we're testing our sick. And we're not testing our asymptomatic. So individuals that need testing for um, going to nursing homes, people that want to test because they're under quarantine, but they're not symptomatic. Other there's a, there's a myriad of reasons that you may want to get tested that you're asymptomatic. Uh, this is an opportunity to come in and get a quick rapid test, uh, and we should be able to give you results back. Uh, I don't want to make any promises, but within a, an hour, a reasonable amount of time. So for the one on Thursday, you would drive in, you would uh, self-administer the swab in your own vehicle. Uh, we would take the, take the test, you drive away, and then we would uh, run the test, and then we would either text, call, uh, or email you back within probably about an hour or so. The one that GCC is going to be a little bit different. Uh, that one is going to be where you drive up, um, you get out of your car, you've got, we're going to have everything coned off, blocked off. Um, you register online for a half an hour time period. Um, so you pull in and then you'll be letting out a certain number of the car at a time. You go inside, there's going to be four stations. We'll be testing four at a time, but it's going to be the same quickness. You're going to come in, you're going to give yourself the, the, the lower nasal swab. It's not one of the brain ticklers that people don't like. It's just a lower, lower nasal uh, quick 10 seconds and then you're out the door and then we'll within an hour or two you'll get notification um so you will have some peace of mind we'll be isolating people a little bit better and uh and driving our numbers back down to an appropriate level to hopefully avoid a color designation which is something that i fear that we're on the track for which is going to really be negatively uh, impacting our, our local businesses Matt, you said, you know, asymptomatic, with which I think is awesome that people can get tested. If you weren't expo exposed, if you weren't on quarantine, can you still just go in for an asymptomatic test and make an, make an appointment for one? You can make it, yes. You, you can make an appointment if you're asymptomatic. Uh, we would hope that you have a reason to believe that you're having a test. Um, I mean, we do have enough slots that we, we, we should be able to bring in about 300 people a day. So we don't think there's going to be a concern. Um, but... Uh, and we also hope that if you're exposed, that you wait uh, a good five days to take the test. Uh, we're not going to turn you away if, it, if you were exposed two days ago, but the effectiveness of the test is going to be, uh, we, we might give some false hope uh, if you end up taking a test and you're negative, but you were only exposed two days ago. And we don't want people going out there and, and acting a little more confidently because they got a negative test because really the effectiveness of the test is after about five days. So. Well, the, the main point I, I let out with is we need volunteers. So I'm reassigning county staff. Uh, myself, I'm going to be over there. Shelly is going to be over there. We have three or four county legislators. We have Gino Jankowski from the city. Uh, you know, we have community leaders all over the place that are stepping up, and I'm very heartened to see who has been stepping up to help us. Um, and there's a, a variety of things that you can do. If you don't want to be near people, we have people that are um, entering the data into the computer. We have people that are making phone calls back to the people with their test results. Uh, people doing the traffic, um, and we will have some people that would have to uh, accept the uh, nasal swab in a sealed bag, and then uh, with a glove on, would take on the other end out, and they would run a test. 
Um, so it, it is going to be PPE all over the place. Uh, these are asymptomatic people. The risk I mean, is if, if you're comfortable going into Walmart, there really isn't that much more risk. But I understand there's some concerns. So we can keep people away if they don't want to have that part of it. Um, and so there is definitely a need. I, I, in that email that I sent out that was shared around, there's contact information. You can call Vicki or email Vicki in my office and sign up for dates. It's going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays, one to four in December and in, uh, through the 21st of January. And, and Matt, if if any of you want to uh, send Yvonne or me an email, we'll forward it on for you, okay? Okay, well, Matt, thank you very much for talking with us about these issues. I'm going to come back to you and Shelly at the, at the very end, but I'd like to bring on uh, Shelly Stein, who is the chair of the Genesee County Legislators. Um, and I would like to ha have her talk a little bit about her role, about the legislator in the county, uh, the legislature, and, um, and its role, which is a huge role in the county. Um, and I would like, Shelly, to start with um, becoming a legislator. Is that something that you are appointed to? Are you elected? And if you are elected, how long do you serve before you have to uh, run for re-election? Sure. Thanks so much, Kathy, for inviting me to be with your class today. And there's many, many familiar faces here. So good morning to everyone. Um, number one, I want to I wanted just take a little bit of a step back, if you don't mind, Kathy. I'm a farm girl. Okay, so I was brought up on the farm. I am one of six children. We were the workforce on the farm. And so understanding traditional roles for me is really hard because we never had them. And so today, serving as a legislator, um, Matt will tell you, I probably jump in just a little bit too quick because I, I want to be a problem solver and I don't step back in that um, observe role, set policy role. And that's probably my greatest challenge as a legislator. So back to the question, am I elected, am I appointed? The community of Leroy is my district and my district is number five. I am elected and I am currently serving a two year term. Two years ago, we did ask the constituency of Genesee County to move our terms to four years and then to stagger them. So every two years, four legislators will be elected. And then the next two years, five legislators will be elected. Inside the nine county legislators, I was elected to become the chair, and that role is a two-year term. So I think I did that, Kathy. You know, a lot of people don't know how very great your, the legislature's job is. Um, I know, you know, coming into a, a county workforce from an, a, a private sector, you have to approve every single thing that goes on in every department in the county. And I think people don't know how you do that. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. Can you describe that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So because of the formation of our county legislature, we have to approve every single dollar that is spent in the county, regardless how big, how small, and there's a process. So there is a human service committee and all of those activities dealing with the human individuals goes through that committee. So that's our department of social services, that's our mental health, that's our office of the aging and that's our youth bureau and I'm probably forgetting one. Oh, maybe Cornell Cooperative Extension and then we have a public service committee, and that is all of the infrastructure that surrounds the people. So that is our highway, our roads and bridges, which Matt's already talked about this morning. That is our planning, our airport, our policing, and our jails. Everything that keeps people 
moving about and safe is our public service. So once every contract, every single um, grant application, grant award, all of those funnel into those two levels of committees of which legislators are assigned. From there, the Ways and Means Committee then gets a say as to, are we gonna spend the money? Will we accept the grant dollars? Will we run this program forward? And how are we gonna pay for it? What's the debt structure of the county look like? What's our health care? What's our workers' compensation? Are we running our elections? What are we doing for our economic development? All that goes through our Ways and Means Committees and every resolution that is passed through the two human service and public service committees and then ways and means finally ends up at the legislature. It's about a four week process to um, get a contract signed. And Kathy, I know that you'll understand and appreciate that. And so will some of our other um, department leaders that are in the class this year. But our role is to protect and understand how every single one of your tax dollars is spent and that it is spent to the highest and best use. That's the oath that we take on as legislators. And I think that's so important, Shelley, that you know the the regular Joe out on the street knows that because I, I don't think they do. I think, you know, a lot of that is missed um, through other people's just day-to-day -day, uh, working that something just magically happens, but it's a very drawn out pro process that um, that you are safeguarding the, the taxpayers with. So I, I really do appreciate that. And, you know, with the jail project, I know there was a lot of discussion back and forth on the jail project project as that goes on and um and with covid as well i mean that's affecting everything um can you just briefly describe how that affects the legislators i sure can first and foremost the chief elected officer of, of every county is assigned to a regional control room and early on in March, it was Jay Gazelle and myself that had to be on these calls. They were every day for about an hour. We tried to get them down to a half an hour and then we've gradually lengthened them out to being weekly calls. And now Matt is the one who accompanies me there. So that's a, that's a whole other life that we are living in that a legislature never had to deal with before, right? And because of the fact that we cannot gather, we are now on Zoom, just as this presentation today in your classwork is on Zoom. So we had to have computers and laptops that would work with um, the infrastructure that we have in the county for technology. We tried kind of being together at one point in a building, half of us could be together, didn't work. And so now everyone zooms in from home or from their office. But we really miss that opportunity to just discuss and have um, good thoughtful conversations together. We really miss each other because being able to bounce ideas off is, um, really healthy for our conversations and you miss that body language um, that you can't really pick up on a zoom call as easily as you can when you're in a room together with people so we feel just a little bit um, limited i would say kathy in in our opportunity to be together like everybody does and to miss those nonverbal communication cues And now I'm going to um, actually bring Matt together uh, with both of you. Um, the the recent elections and the recent um, campaigns and things like that, um, the polarization around our the elections, the the uh, social media 
the polarization that's going on is uh, is very troubling. And I'm wondering, as a leader, how can you address that? How can you navigate through that? Um, it, it just seems to have gotten so much worse within the last few years. And uh, I, I just wonder how, how as a leader you can handle that. So Matt, I'd, I'd like to start if I could. Fire away. <laughs> okay, so you model the behavior that you want your community to live in. Bottom line, if, if you have a disagreement with um, an idea, a topic, a person, you certainly don't take that on, out on the person, you take it out on the topic and you agree to disagree and walk away. But if, if you don't model that and behave in that manner, I don't know how you can ask others to do that, right? But we also have to listen twice and speak once. Matt, I'll let you go. Sure, I, I, one of the things is not to add to it. Um, you're right, there is a polarization. It seems like every issue, every topic has one side or the other, and there's a lot of preconceived notions of how you, with the side you're supposed to be on. So I try not to add to it, um, simple as that. Um, that I'm, I'm trying to be right down the middle, understand that everyone's got viewpoints, uh, where, where it has been very frustrating. So, so I'm saying I don't add to it, but I do acknowledge it, and it's been very frustrating is in how our numbers are spiking and, and how the, the impact of, when I say our numbers are spiking, our positivity rates are going through the roof um, and, and the actions that we're, that we're taking to try to offset that, to, to flatten that, to, to help uh, both uh, the health of the community, but then also the businesses of the community with, the, with trying to avoid shutdowns. Um, what I try to do is appeal to whatever works to get to the end result. So at the end of the day, we want to keep our businesses open. We want our community safe and healthy. Um, so if, if there's a population that I'm speaking to that uh, maybe, uh, maybe the angle of, well, it helped me keep the businesses open. So wear the mask for that purpose. And I'll try that route. Or if there's people that, that, that uh, truly are fearful of the, of the pandemic, then, 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 then you're talking about the, the reality of the disease more. So one, don't add to the polarization. Uh, I've always been a, a kind of a, a peacekeeper mentality, uh, go down the middle of the road, find compromise. I, 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 I like uh, people that, that find middle ground and compromise and don't go back to their side and, and, and dig their heels into the ground. Um, so that, that's basically what, what, I, what I do with polarization. I, I acknowledge it. I don't add to it. I try to find common ground and then try, try to move everyone in the right direction. Do you feel like with the testing uh, that there are people that uh, think we shouldn't be testing as much or uh, why should we bother? So I was in contact with someone, I, I feel fine. Why should I have to go for a test? Why should I have to quarantine? Yeah, there's, there's the frustrating part. There is a lot of, of mindset that people have. Uh, and, and again, so I could beat my head against the wall and argue with these people uh, what I try to do is I find a reason that the, most people can get behind. So regardless of what people's opinions are with the mask, I don't think there's any people that want to shut down our businesses. So that's, again, that's, that's the way I've been able to find that common ground that I'll say, you know, wear it and help us out to help. And I'll list out a couple of local business owners that have been wonderful and that they'll, they'll, look, they'll you know, I've dealt with Kathy Fryer over at the Tapes Original for a lot of other things. And I'll say, look, help keep. You have to keep your business open. And usually that works if, if I try that way. Um, you're right, I could, I could beat my head against the wall and, and it's very frustrating to deal with uh, some, of, some of this and the comments that are out there of, um, that, that I read. That, that, and, and it doesn't just bother me at times. I know our health departments who just work, you know, there was some stuff out there on social media how you know, they took off a long four day weekend. No, they were in there working over the four day weekend, but because they're spending all their time on contract uh, investigations, health, uh, all the investigations, the cases, and the tracing, and, and even at working as fast as they can, they're behind working over a holiday weekend and to be called out on because they're not providing an update right away to certain people is very frustrating um, to, to our staff. But. And I, I would add to that, that 
whether whether you believe you know the left side the right side i don't really care what i'm asking you to do is be a decent human being to others so that comes down to that respect level of everybody has a role in a democracy right whether you feel it's been treated as a democracy or not i don't care but right now we all have a role as a person in the United States of America to help care for each other. And that's the side I will come down on every time. And I believe me, I am in a industry of agriculture where we have been deemed essential right from March. And so there's parts of our world that haven't changed. Our daily lives haven't changed because we care for cattle, right? And so why, why should I do this, you know, now when I haven't had to do it then? So I, our, my message here is always, this isn't about you. This is about others. And that's your role and responsibility as an individual in our country and in our town and in our workplace. I hope that helps. And Shelly, that's that is a great statement on civic responsibility to, you know, to watch out for uh, our country, to support our country, but to to give what you can to contribute to that. Um, I know Matt has a philosophy for our county workers is um, when we're in our workstations, if we're segregated, um, we like I'm not masked right now, but stand up, mask up. And um, that's just my my take on it too is stand up mask up you don't want to um any, uh, any risk of infecting anyone else uh in fact that was our household word when i had thanksgiving i had a very small uh my sister and brother but we uh and we were segregated and when we stood up we put our mask on and i said that's the rule of the house is stand up mask up so so uh, anyways, I want to thank Shelly and Matt very much for uh, talking in such a, a wonderful way, eloquent way uh, about civic leadership, about their role in government. Um, Peggy, do we have time to, for any other questions? Yes, so if anyone has a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it or you can put it into the chat. So yes, we do have a few minutes, please. Please ask questions. Pat, this is Steve. Hey, Steve. Good to see you again, my friend. Yes. Um, what do you see or what do you perceive as the future of government and civic duty for people continuing on, like succession planning? Do you see the, the younger generations having an interest in local government, whether it be at the town, village, county level, or do you see that waning? Well, I, I hope it doesn't wane, because I think that, uh, the, that that county government and local governments is, is, is here to stay for a while. You know, it's not, we're not getting outsourced to China, so we're gonna be here providing service. We, we are a, a people-centric, uh, intensive service whether it's our law enforcement, uh, criminal justice side, whether it's, it's assistance, whether it's through DSS, through mental health, obviously the aging, um, and, and we're running basic government functions like running our elections. Um, there is there is a, a need for county government. Um, we, in here in Genesee County, can do a better job of attracting people. And, and um, I think historically over time, um, partly because of some of the pressures that I mentioned earlier about the bridges, and that's something that unique to Genesee County. Um, this legislature has, has taken a great approach over the last few years with some key uh, staff firings in this county to help position us better. And, and one of those things that we've done just recently is adding a deputy HR director because our, our, our human resource department uh, is, is, is key for us to attract uh, quality uh, employees fill a lot of these needs in our county. Um, so we have to make ourselves more attractive. We have to communicate better as a county government and make, and make this uh, you know, in, in service delivery and make this also a place that people want to come to. 
Um, we, we recently worked with uh, a PIO firm to help with our message delivery through the, through the pandemic. And we want to make ourselves as accounting more accessible to uh, people and, and to, uh, to make it easier to interact with county government. So uh, we, we have a responsibility to, to shine and make this a place that people want to come to work for. Um, but I think naturally uh, we have the benefit as versus other organizations and sectors that we are going to be here. Um, so, um, and, and hopefully that, that people see us as a benefit to work for in the future, but uh, we all have the stewards of the, of the, the, the public money to, to put our best foot forward and, and do great work for the, for the local citizens. So that's what we'll continue to do. Okay. Well, the reason, the reason why I asked the question is there's a trend in the fire service that there, there's so much apathy because of the requirements of leadership. I, I'm blessed here at City Fire. I've got four great captains, four great lieutenants, and I always tell them, I go, you know, we do a lot of su work on succession planning, but some of the, you know, some of the officers are like, you know, Chief, it's not worth the headache. And then you take a look at the, 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 the unpaid professional side of the fire service, and there's no compensation and what the requirements are and there's just a general apathy um, um, among, I don't want to say younger people, but there's a general apathy um, where it, it, there's too much responsibility um, and uh, it, it's just not attractive enough. You know, there are those that have are very civic minded and, and have a civic duty and responsibility. However, you know, I was just wondering, you know, what was your opinion? You know, um, a lot of people for, I think the city council people make $3,500 a year uh, to, to be ridiculed 24 seven, 365 for whatever decision they make, which they think is in the best interest. And, and then we divide that up by the parochialism of six different wards and then three at large wards, you, you know, and uh, I just wanted to know what you thought or, and I'm going to give you a follow-up question, if you don't mind. How do we develop a, a succession program for these local villages, towns, cities, county um, bodies to, I mean, what, what type of succession planning program do you envision or, uh, you know, and let's face it, you can go work in the private sector and make a lot more money than you can in government. You're, you're right, Steve. It's, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge. It'll continue to be a challenge. Uh, lead, local leaders should continue to tackle it and, and, and foster uh, succession planning. You know, here at the county, uh, we, we try to think more than one position out. We, we try to think of our department heads, who's who's the person to step up, not only for succession planning, but just in general, the person is is unfortunately out on a long period of time. So it's, it's good practice to have, not even looking for the future, but just right now, um, so uh, that's what we do here at, at the county. We do our best to do. You, you know, you the issue you have with the fire recruitment, and, and that's that's a statewide, and nationwide, and nationwide issue with with fire recruitment, um, and in general, uh, you know, there's that's a challenge that every organization has uh, that that will continue to work on um, with with local leaders uh, through elected officials and boards. That's that's it's long before our time and they'll be there after. And, that, and that one of the challenges with that, Steve, is because a lot of that is dictated through uh, political party and, um, you know, getting involved in you. And just, that's just the reality of being on these boards is a lot of times these are, you know, people looking, you know, you have to basically go to the leadership of local political parties and have them foster this uh, because uh, you can be a person that's a potential great leader in our community but if you're not aligned or you're not part of uh, a local party within your own town or village, and you want to be on the board, you may not be able to have the opportunity. So it's a lot contingent on uh, the leadership of our, of our political leaders as well to make sure that they are being as inclusive and that they are uh, actively recruiting good people into their parties. Um, as far as working for local governments, not necessarily in the, the board role, uh, with a town or village level or the county level, uh, we are um, the beneficiary of people that come to work for the government. A lot of times are, are, are local people that are giving a hometown discount. I mean, I, 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 I love working here in Genesee County. Um, when, I, when I came to Genesee County, the reason I came to Genesee County uh, for the private sector, because uh, I was working on Rochester for, for many years and 
and I was resigned to just having the commute the rest of my life. Um, but I traded off, um, you know, a, a much more potentially lucrative future out in the private sector for the fact that uh, I can live and work here in my community. And I think that we get a lot of that. I see that in county government around the department head level that we get people willing to uh, trade off, uh, you know, maybe higher expectations of compensation because they want to give to the community to a certain level. So uh, as long as there's that spirit that continues on, we'll, we'll still get that benefit. And that's partly also having a thriving community. As long as we are a community that's, that's, that's a, a strong, relatively thriving community, we'll continue to have those type of people. So we have to make sure we try to support the GCDCs of the world to, to bring in the companies uh, that, that allow our young people to stay here and to allow this cycle to continue of having people that are, are living locally that want to stay here and give back to the community. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. No, no, I, and I appreciate that, Matt. Thank you. So Steve, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to answer in a different way. So as the legislator, we see that it's our role to determine our future. And so we have a fire service task force that we formed that um, is talking to those rural communities who have the non-professional fire service and emergency services that respond, right? We, we see that as our role to try to decipher what our future is gonna be. And it won't be long before the conversation will um, invite in the city because we recognize that there is a gap of volunteers, especially in that area. And so we can't just sweep it under a rug and say it's not happening to us. So we took the position popular or unpopular to try to plan for our future. And so that's, that is part of the responsibility of the legislature is where, where do we need to go and how should we get there? And so bringing folks together to have these conversations and to ask these really hard, terrible, difficult questions, right? Is, is where we are today. And then for the local government, I would say as a town councilman and as a supervisor, the day-to-day -day quality of life impact that you can have on your community members and the life and the quality of life in your community, there is no other level of government that is as close to the people as a town or a village. And it is a satisfying opportunity to bring back good to your community. And so I know that our children being brought up in a household where um, mom was busy with that early on in their lives, they know that that's something that they want to do already and that they have a background and a foundation in local government. That I think our school districts, um, so now I'm gonna get hit by the school folks, but our, our opportunity to have schools share that message just a little bit farther or invite in um, those who serve on the local governments like Dave and like other members of your previous LG classes I think that would really be rewarding for our students today. Thanks. Shelley, I have to uh, agree with you. In, in fact, I have a, a daughter who is a health teacher and just going through the whole election process. And um, she said, you know, so much attention is paid to um, the federal government, but she said it needs to be focused more on the local because she didn't know a lot of the people that were running in lo local government and, and what their roles were. So that, that does ring true exactly what you said. Thank you. Kathy, if I may, there was a question in the chat that I wanna read just in case people aren't able to ex um, access it. I know someone who is having symptoms now and her husband did test positive, but they have instructed her that she quarantine and not have having her tested. For people in that situation, will that be changing with this new rollout? Um, and Shelly, thankfully, um, she answered in the chat, no, follow the health department guidance. So I just wanted to make sure that was out there with everyone. 
Thank you. Again, this is, this is asymptomatic. You have not been exposed. You are not under quarantine. That's what this new rollout of testing allows us to do. I just wanted to take a moment. Uh, I'm Ned Dale, the superintendent at Elba Schools. And with being one of three superintendents in this uh, first, Matt, I wanted to make sure that I recognized Paul Pettit uh, for his outstanding work with us uh, to try to keep schools open. We certainly couldn't do it without him and uh, have certainly seen our, um, uh, you know, numerous infections, unfortunately. Um, I, th I think one of the pieces that I would just uh, lend to you as you continue to do this asymptomatic testing, um, Candidly, I can see it's a numbers game a bit, um, you know, uh, testing asymptomatic people just to keep businesses and schools open to try to lower that infection rate um, is frustrating because at the same time, we don't have enough tests to do all of the testing. So uh, I think the one piece that I would encourage or, or ask for your advocacy is that um, educators are not essential employees. And so the difficulty becomes um, what will close schools, especially in small rural schools, is being quarantined, uh, asymptomatic quarantine with negative tests. Um, uh, as my wife is a nurse, uh, she, uh, we recently, uh, I was recently quarantined for two weeks uh, with my daughter who was positive, again, all is well. Um, but my wife went back to work pretty quickly. And unfortunately, um, I, I lost a cleaner last night and a, uh, a cleaner, a custodian and another uh, support provider. Um, so we've lost three staff members in 24 hours. And what will close us is this non-essential uh, employee. Uh, and, and that's something that I could, we could only ask that you advocate in any avenues, channels that you're able to do so. Um, because I can tell you as a small rural school, that will be the issue that will close us. Um, the student students are not getting sick in school. They're not transmitting it. Our reopening plans have worked. Um, we're cleaning more than ever. Um, we have barriers at every learning station, at every desk, so that they not only kids are only have masks, but they have barriers. Um, and that was a, a thanks to a huge donation from Traco Manufacturing. Um, and can't say thank you enough uh, to Dan and his family for that. But again, I want to definitely throw out a kudos to Paul Pettit um, and his team and the school specialists that have been hired to assist us with this contact tracing. Um, and again, I just wanted to advocate that um, school employees not being uh, essential, cleaners not being essential, food service um, people not being essential is really going to hurt um, districts, especially when we're called on to provide meals, provide instruction, um, and maintain what I consider essential duties. So, Ned, I would say to you that yesterday in the control room, we did learn that the winter plan that has been um, drafted by the state indicates that it is our best goal to keep K through eight education open, even in areas that are orange or red, because we recognize, or the state is recognized, I should say, the tremendous job that schools have been doing with our students. And it also helps with students having a regular structure for themselves and for parents. And that goes directly to mental health at the same time, right? So this was a big step, a big step in a big aha moment for the state to, to really draw a line in the sand that the K through eight schools are really essential to our community's good health and and making sure to keep the schools open. So I understand about the essential nature of teachers and the staff, not really sure that, that they've thought that far down the road, but the idea that those, those students, the K through eight students need those schools is really important. That was a big step yesterday. So thank you for recognizing that also. Yeah, and Shelly, I would just ask that if you get in that control room opportunity, that please share that um, we, we agree K-8 in-person learning is absolutely essential, but unless they deem employees essential, it won't matter. It will, there's too many people getting quarantined. I, I just, we don't have enough substitutes able to come in and fill these positions. Because again, um, we have asymptomatic people um, who test negative. It doesn't matter if they test negative, they still can't come back. Um, so that's just something that, again, if you get that opportunity to advocate and channel, um, 
we we want them. I'm I'm fortunate. I'm I'm going to be one of ten superintendents meeting with the commissioner of education next Monday evening, um, and we'll, I'm definitely that's number one on my priority list is to communicate that to her as she's seeking that that input. Um, and at the same time, we still do not have any idea how much state aid we'll be getting. Um, and that is because uh, the governor has continued to say 20%. And 20% uh, of our operating budget here in Elba is uh, just approximately a million dollars or 10% of our budget. So uh, that, that, those are, again, I know Matt's facing uh, skyrocketing overtime costs. Uh, we're finding those same things uh, with clean, you know, we just trying to keep the building clean. Um, but again, essential employees, I'm glad the state finally deemed us as K-8 is important and essential. Now they need to take that next step and deem us as essential employees so that I can maintain a staff here. We'll send that up. Thank you. Kathy, there's a question in the chat box. Circling back to local government, I think that there are some roadblocks within our county and Batavia specifically to entice young people to join. Young people are commuting from outside of the city. I personally, com excuse me, commute from another county and I would love to volunteer on boards to serve for Genesee County because I am in Genesee County more than my home county, but can't serve on city boards because I don't live in the county yet. I, excuse me, sorry. I always see that there are vaccines on various boards, vacancies, sorry. <laughs> the note, the the uh, chat's moving. Um, I always see that there are vac vacancies. vacancies, thank you, on various boards. Expanding on this, how can we become involved despite the roadblocks? Phew. Sorry, Yvonne. So I think that um, election law is probably one of the most difficult laws to change. And there is um, a residency requirement to serve on a board that you're being elected to, right? Those boards that have um, appointment powers so that you might be appointed to a board, those are things that I would bring forward to who, whoever the level of government is that um, would have the appointment power there to ask about changing a residency requirement. At the same time, if a board has the power to spend the people's money, I would want my neighbors and my common property owners to be the ones that are making those decisions. Matt, I don't know. Yeah, if you have I, I think that it really depends on the actual board. I think there is instances um, that it probably makes logical sense that if you're not from the area that you can still contribute, but it's going to be a board by board, case by case scenario, depending on are there people within, for example, if there was a board and it was for the city of Batavia and there was three people that wanted to be on the board, two of them were city of Batavia residents, they're probably going to get preferential treatment and, and in most cases should. If there's vacancies and no one wants to serve and there's somebody uh, such as yourself that wants to, to serve even though you don't live in the city um, and you can bring expertise or bring value to the board and um, there isn't a component to it where you're, again, you're spending the resources if you're uh, elected, then certainly I think that that's, uh, that should be examined. And that, that'll be up to the um, governing body of, of that board to make that determination. Uh, sometimes, there's, sometimes there's maybe restrictions already in place that can be changed through bylaw changes. Um, sometimes it'll be legal, but it really is a case by case. And I definitely don't like to speak in absolutes. And, and so there's certainly, in my opinion, if it was a county board, um, by all means, if there's a county board that you're interested in serving on, then you've got my contact information and I, I welcome reaching out and, and asking about it and we would address an individual board um, and, and the, the reasoning behind uh, the makeup of it. So and we have an example of that just last month, our criminal justice advisory board, there was a request from the community and there was a review and a change has been made. And so I really think that when, when there's an ask and there's an opportunity to review and allow for a, a response, that your local government can be really responsive. So don't give up. 
I really appreciate the information. Um, like I had wanted to be on the youth board, but because I live in Niagara County, can't do that. And so they were like, oh, you, you would have to challenge the charter. It's a whole thing. And uh, then I saw that on the tidbits, there were still seven vacancies. And so I was like, ah, like this is something that like I want to do. But on the other hand, like I absolutely think that should go to residents first. But if there are spaces, there might be exceptions. And that's in the city charity? Yeah. I can't talk to that then because their charter is different than than our level. Absolutely. And local government, it's, it's fascinating. I will say that the entire process is so fascinating and they're all different pieces. And I think that it's important for people to be knowledgeable on those things. Um, each each county is going to be different. Each city is going to be different. But, you know, I like this place. So it's great. I, I would actually, um, Peggy and Yvonne, maybe an opportunity to just sit in on a Genesee Association of Municipalities meeting. Dave, maybe that's something that you could help to facilitate. Every month, the elected leaders from every um, level of government, right? So village mayors, town supervisors, city council, and county legislators, we have a conversation together once a month. We have a standing agenda. And there is a round table where every community gets to talk about what they're doing, what their challenges are, if there's great ideas that they could share. And this, it's kind of like an idea soup um, that really has worked well. There have been a lot of sharing of services through this, um, what we call GAM. And um, I, think, I think you'd be impressed let me put it that way, as to the activity that is going on in our local towns and villages and how one idea just kind of grows another idea and the organic learning and sharing that goes on is um, it's really fascinating and I'm really proud. I'm proud to be in local government in Genesee County. Yeah, Shelly, we'll be happy to do that. And I think having, are those meetings on Zoom now? They are, yeah. So that, that makes it even easier for people too. So if we get the link, Dave, um, we'll talk with you and, and we'll put that out to Algiers. And so that's a great opportunity. Thanks, Shelly. You're welcome. Thank you. If you can take some time and just sit in and, and watch us go. I will do that. I used to go to those meetings. I really enjoyed them. Thank you. What a great discussion we've had. I, I really appreciate uh, Shelly and Matt coming in and, and uh, sharing with us. It's just been very, uh, very meaningful. Great, no problem. Our pleasure and we're, we're local and we serve you. So don't forget to involve us in conversations, please. Because today we can't read everybody's minds as much as we think that we can, we really can't. So thank you. <laughs> super, super, super. All right. So next up, um, I think we have Sarah, right? Yes. All right, so I'm just gonna dive in. It's not my thing, but they tell me I have to talk, so. Um, <laughs> I will also say that uh, the next thing that I'm going to share with you is also very much not my thing, um, but it's a way that we wanted to do something a little bit different. So I videotaped my dad, who is the assistant chief at the Indian Falls Fire Department. And so our last conversation kind of leads us into this. Um, he explains what volunteer fire department is like in Indian Falls, which please understand that what happens in Indian Falls is similar to, but not what happens everywhere else. Um, and is very different than what happens in, in the chief's uh, city fire department. So uh, I hope you enjoy the video. Like I said, it's very simple. There's a few little mistakes. He goes sideways at one point that I didn't catch. So um, I just hope you enjoy it and I'll at, take questions after it's over. Thanks, Ron.
bump to Chad. Okay, so we're going to bump to Chad, and I think Kitty and Dave are handling that. Yes. No one circles the wagons like leadership, Genesee, Peggy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, guys, I'm Chad Zambito. I'm a town councilman in the town of Atavia. I'm here for Greg Post, who is our supervisor and a heck of a guy, if you know him, who's always busy. So I actually have a call. I have to be on at 11. So I'm going to blow through some questions that I've been sent. You know, feel free to throw up the hand if you want me to answer. And then I'd, I'd really like to see what you guys want to know about uh, about local government. I listened to uh, Shelly and to Matt, who I have tremendous respect for both of them. You know, both community minded people, very busy people that still find time to, to do things in the community. And, um, you know, uh, I respect what they do. It's not an easy job. So I'm a town councilman. I am elected for four years. Uh, it's funny in a town of Batavia. Uh, if you get the Republican endorsement, you normally don't run for an election. Um, I've run a primary in my own party, but I've never actually had a run. I mean, I'm on the ballot, but I'm not running against anybody. I'm unopposed. Uh, why did I seek this position? I have to uh, to uh, blame my high school football coach and social studies coach, Charlie O'Gene, uh, who instilled in me early on uh, the love of uh, civics, uh, the idea of a Renaissance man and the Greek philosophy of being a good citizen. And it's just always something I was interested in. Uh, I was working at the radio station WBTA and started covering local government. And at the time, I was right out of college, realized how little I knew about local government and, uh, you know, some of the turns that they, uh, they used. So it, it was something I was interested in. It came open. I took it. Um, I am compensated for this position. We actually, in the town of TV, we make $10,000 a year, which is more than city council makes. So um, I wouldn't say anyone does it for the money, um, but it, you know, public service is what you put into it. I mean, you honestly could spend an hour a week reading minutes and looking over the agenda and then go to the table and vote. You're elected, you're held only responsible to the citizens. You could make this a full-time job like Shelly Stein does. Uh, I am somewhere in the middle. You know, there are weeks where I get, you know, get by in 10 or 15 hours. There are weeks you swear it's a full-time job. And it's it's just the, the way of the world. I mean, we're always looking at emails. You know, I'm jumping in and out of conversations. I'll jump out of this, you know, with my town board hat and jump to my full-time job for a, a sales call at 11 o'clock. So, you know, it's hard to keep track of those hours. It just, you know, I'm sure you guys can appreciate the day kind of flies by. Town of Batavia has 7,000 residents. Um, sources of revenue for us, obviously taxes are our source of revenue. For the longest time, the Town of Batavia did not have a tax rate. Um, we were using fund balance that was largely developed by some land that was sold early on. If you know, you know, Veterans Memorial Drive in Batavia, which is actually in the town where Walmart is and uh, Target and all that. Um, the land that I believe the um, car wash is now on was owned by the town and was donated by some sisters years ago uh, to become a town hall. That didn't happen. That was sold. And for the longest time, we had that money. So we have a tax base. We raise about a million dollars through our tax levy. Uh, we also get funding from the county. Uh, we get sales tax. L uh, last year was supposed to be $2.3 million dollars. And then COVID happened and no one knew it was going to happen. And the county needed to build the jail and didn't know where that money was coming from. So um, there was a, we were putting our budget together in October and we just finally approved it on November 18th. We weren't sure what our funding was going to be. And if you talk to your school personnel, this is all too familiar to them. You're making a budget and you don't know exactly what your revenue is going to be. It's a, a difficult position to be in. So, um, it's certainly conversations. At the time, we were talking about an 89% in, uh, increase in taxes, which sounds horrible. And it is, but it was basically going from $2.40 to about $4.90 per thousand assessed. And a lot of people don't understand how they're taxed, and it always amazes me. You know, so in your where you're living in your house, you're probably you're definitely paying county tax. You're paying school tax. Those are usually the biggest two costs per thousand. I'll just say it's $45 cost per thousand where you are of your assessed value. And my computers went blank. There we go. Uh, of your assessed value. Um, ten, five to 10 of that's probably your local municipality. Some of it may be a fire district or other special districts. 10, roughly, just under 10 now is the county. 
And then there's your school tax, which is $25 to $30 per thousand assessed. And when we talk about going up 89%, that's just on your town levy portion, not the whole bill. So people were really losing their minds, but they didn't quite understand. So part of it was just to educate uh, and tell people what was really going on. Uh, long story short, we didn't have to go that way. We bumped our tax rate to $2.80 from $2.40 roughly. Hopefully the county, because the property tax increase, because their assessment went up, actually had to drop the tax levy. So net for our folks was about nine cents per thousand assessed, which again, we have people, Town of Batavia is an interesting position. We have, you know, people that are on fixed income, have multimillionaires that live in the town. So it's a wide gamut. Um, and, you know, any increase is always tough for someone to swallow, but we're pretty comfortable at $9 per thousand assessed, which means if you have a $100,000 house, or I'm sorry, nine cents, if you have a $100,000 house, you're paying an extra nine bucks a year. Um, so it wasn't as bad as it, it really seemed. So those are our sources of revenue. We get uh, tax base, we get funding from the county. We used to get some host money because uh, uh, Tavia Down sits within part of the town and part of the city. Um, we sometimes get some revenue from courts um, we have a big discussion at the town. We don't want our town to be a revenue court. We want it to be a justice court. Obviously, it's up to the elected judges how they decide to do this, but we've always instilled in them, we want justice court. You know, if the guy has been speeding down the throughway and has four tickets, you know what? Throw the book at him, you know, write the highest you can. If we've got a single mom that missed a registration because she's got 18 things going on, I, in my mind, she doesn't get treated the same. So, um, that's kind of the way we've always looked at that. We have about 60 employees in the town, about 20 or 25 are full-time, 40 are part-time. That includes the town board, which is five people. That includes the assessment board of review, the zoning board, there's another 15 or so there, um, and some part-time people. Water and sewer is a big part of what we do. Highway is a big part of what we do. And then just the general operation of the town, getting your tax bills out, paying your water bill, uh, getting a building permit, all the things that our folks do on a daily basis to, to serve our constituents. I did do some quick math. I think we're probably spending about $1,600 per resident. Um, so when you take all the funding into account and what you pay in taxes, uh, you know, in normal household, you're probably breaking even or depending on what your assessment is, maybe you're, you know, getting more in service than you're actually putting in, which we can't say about everything, that's for sure. Um, our fiscal year starts January 1st. Um, and, you know, we have, a unlike the state legislature, we we'll have a big problem with, uh, not our local representative, obviously, Steve Hawley is wonderful. But, um, you know, besides, besides that, everything in Albany seems a little messed up to me. Um, you know, they pushed a budget around. Um, they're our biggest problem as far as I'm concerned, and they affect the county way more than they affect us, but all the unfunded mandates they send down to us, half of your bill from the county goes to Medicaid spending, um, you know, and it's just, it goes on and on and on. Uh, the court system, they want us to put more and more and more money into the courts, but, but of course, you know, now with bail reform, you know, we, we can't put anybody in jail. It's just, it's been a, a real struggle this year. You had COVID on top of that. I mean, New York State was $150 billion in debt before COVID. So to hear Governor Cuomo lecture uh, counties and municipalities about being, uh, uh, you know, frugal with their money and, and, uh, uh, and real responsible with their spending kind of sticks in my side a little bit. So I'll be honest about that. There are five of us on our board. Uh, we have a four-year term. Um, we have one supervisor who's elected, so there's four council people. Uh, Greg Post is our supervisor. I also sit with Patty Michael Act, Dan Underhill, Sharon White. We have a nice group of people, um, uh, you know, a wide range of experience, long-term town residents. Um, what's affected us most about my life? I, I love it. I mean, it can be a pain. You might get stopped in the grocery store. You might get a nasty email or a nasty phone call from someone that isn't happy. Uh, I have a neighbor that may be suing the town. I mean, you know, there's things like this that happen. Um, but at the end of the day, I find more good out of it. I like being involved. I like the people I work with. Um, and again, like they said, you know, you really can affect your community better at the local level. And people get all upset about the national election. And you know what? They're so far removed from us. 
what happens in Washington takes so long to trickle down, concentrate on, and even if you don't, you're sick of, you don't want to vote for president, you've seen too much, you know, go out and vote for your local people because they affect you every day. And I've always said, our government's completely upside down. The local people should have the most control over your daily life. It's not always the case. The state has probably more control because of everything they, they push down on us. And yeah, I absolutely do it all over again. I've been on the town council. I did one run uh, for about four years. I had to step down because I took a position with the Economic Development Center. Um, and once I was no longer there, I decided I wanted to get back in. There was an opening. So I've got 10, maybe closer to 12 years of experience on the council. This was honestly our hardest year ever. Uh, you know, with, And I'm sure that's true for everybody, but with COVID, and, and just the budget we were facing and the uncertainty, you know, and, and we sit around the table, you know, like like a household. OK, here's what we're expecting for revenue. And you never know. You might get a raise. Someone could lose a job. You don't know what's going to happen. So here's what we expect. Here's what our bills are. There's one or two ways to do that. We can increase revenues by raising taxes, which nobody wants to do. We can dip into our rainy day fund, which I made the case. It's raining. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I don't know how much. I'm sure it can always get worse, but with the COVID situation, you know, to me that was a, at least a steady downpour that uh, we needed to account for. But who knows what next year looks like? I mean, 2021. You know, we hope the vaccine is good and people, and this turns around and we get back on track. But I got to tell you, looking at it right now, I also think it's just as likely that by Christmas we're all in full lockdown again, and who knows what's going on. So, um, and I, I would say to anybody, you know. What's always disappointed me is, A, the lack of understanding of what happens in local government. Um, I have people that don't know if they live in the town or the city. Okay, I get that. You're busy with your life. You get up, you drive to Buffalo, you drive to Rochester, you got kids, you know, you're taking classes, whatever, things go on, I get that. But the amount of people that complain through social media and other outlets that just have absolutely no idea what they're talking about drives me nuts. At least educate yourself a little bit. And that's partly why I like doing things like this, so you can understand it you know, what your taxes are about, what they go for, the restrictions is on us. You know, every, oh, we got to treat this like a business. Well, yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, there's always hard decisions in businesses. There's hard decisions in families. You never make everybody happy. And, and that's the problem. Um, you know, I, the city council, I think, is undercompensated for what they do. Uh, and, be, and like, again, no one does it for the money, but the amount of time you put in and to get good people that the other issue is because they get beat up in the media a little bit. We don't have that as much in the town. We're a little bit off the radar. Plus, we're all similar minded. There's no political grandstanding that goes on. You know, we work through a lot of conversations in work session. By the time we get to the board meeting, you know, we know what to, we're just voting because we know we worked all the details out. But, you know, the part of the problem is I've talked to business people. I said, you'd be great for city council, run for city council. Are you crazy? I lose half my business. Our supervisor, Greg Post is in the same position. I mean, he, you know, he works, he tries not to work in the town, but his business because of the development that we have and the ag park and everything else that's going on, you know, he has to turn down some jobs sometimes. And that's unfortunate. So I think that's part of the problem. The other thing I'd say is I heard someone say that, you know, I can't be on this board. I can't be on that board. And I get that. And I, some of it, I understand some of it. I don't, but there's always something you can do, uh, you know, volunteer at the church, the school. Um, there's always committees. There's always something to do. Uh, the day of caring is a wonderful thing. We've done that at the town uh, board for a while, um, you know, do something like that. And the other one that disappoints me is I've been a councilman for 12, almost 12 years. We meet every Wednesday, you know, barring a few things here and there. No one shows up to our meetings. I mean, we've had maybe 50 people over that amount of time come to our meetings. And usually it's because they're upset about something. And I get that. They misunderstand. Nine times out of 10, they walk out with a better understanding. They may not necessarily agree, but they understand the position that we're in. And, uh, you know, they usually walk away feeling at least a little better and feeling like they were heard. And I think that's the biggest thing. You have to listen to people. I mean, you know, that's part of our job. So I've rambled on for a while here. I want to throw it off. Are there questions? Uh, be happy to answer. Um, I know they talked about the fire department. That is a big issue for us. And I think this also touches on something. We have less and less volunteers. Uh, God bless volunteer firemen. They do things that other people are paid pretty well for. And the rest of us reap the benefits on that. Um, and I, you know, anything we can do for the firefighters is always worth doing. I wish we could compensate them better. I wish we could give them a tax break. 
I wish we could give them some savings towards retirement. And there's been some talk on that through the legislature. You know, uh, again, we need more incentive. People are busy, you know, uh, our social clubs, they're, they're dying, churches are shrinking. Um, part of it is apathy. Um, part of it is this world we live in where I can sit in my house and never leave. I, you know, you don't even, there's a lot of people who don't even care what community they live in. What's the Wi-Fi connection like? Because I'm just going to shop on Amazon and get everything in anyway. So the idea of community has kind of gone away and that's going to hurt us long term. Uh, but we really at a county level need to, and part of the problem, again, the state has so many regulations. We really need to figure out a paid volunteer and hybrid. Um, that needs to work um, because we've, it's costly in the city. The city guys do a great job. They provide support. It's costly in the town, obviously, but you know we've got a little less of that cost. We need something that kind of puts the two together. I mean, we've got a ton of firehouses across this county. We should be able to cover everything um, and, and really do it. Not that we don't do a good job now. We do a very good job now. I'm worried about down the road when, you know, you look at your fire company, I'm going to guess the average age of those guys are 50, 55 years old. You got a few young guys in there and you got the old timers that are going to be there until they die. And there's, you know, there's not a lot in between. It's the hot, you know, it's older folks and a couple younger guys here and there. And, you know, that's a job that really, I, you know, most, most firefighters are about 50 because it's, you know, it's a physical job. You, you need to, to be up for the challenge. Chad, I will bet you money that there's some departments that actually have women too. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no, no question. The city part of the fire has uh, has, has uh, fire people, fire women. Whatever. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not always. Sorry, I, I had to, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, yeah, men and women, you're 100 right. Um, that do this job, that volunteer, um, and it's the other thing. I mean, we've talked in the town. You don't have to be a town resident to volunteer on the town fire board. You know, we just we need warm, able bodies. Another thing too is um, uh, the fact that you know the state has made it harder on fire companies. You know they can't do their raffles. They don't have beer tents anymore. So part of their funding has gone away. Which guess what? That's just going to come back on you, the taxpayer. What do I believe the town can accomplish in ten in the next ten years? So in the next ten years, I think we're going to continue to grow our economy with, you know, working with the EDC and, you know, you can look at economic development a couple of ways. I've heard a court called corporate welfare. And you know what? I understand that. Here's the thing in New York state, we're the highest tax state in the nation. One of the most difficult to do business with. We're competing on a global scale. If you don't have local folks on the ground fighting for us every day, like the EDC, we wouldn't get, you know, a, a, we get a fraction of what we get. We've got to compete against other countries, other states, and Buffalo and Rochester. So, you know, we have to put our best foot forward. So I think we'll continue to grow economic development. I think we've got to change the way we're doing business. We got to look at more, you know, into uh, virtual and we're doing some virtual meetings for the town hall. And the other one is housing. We've got to really talk about housing in this county. Um, we have kind of a soft spot. You know, we've got lots of starter homes, 150 and under. We've got some beautiful, more expensive homes. That middle class, that 150 to 300 is kind of short. Also, we've got an aging population. You know, a lot of the houses in the city and the older houses, older stock, and, you know, they're two-story, one and a half bath. You know, we need more of those patio homes. We need the aging in place. Uh, and I think that's kind of the direction we have to go in. I mean, this is a great place to live, especially now. I, I'm working from home more than ever. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about a commute as much. So, you know, people can invest where they want to live, where they want to raise their kids and where their families are. And, you know, we have, we can make really a, a great case for that. We do. Yeah. Town of Batavia has a question. If we offer uh, other services, absolutely. You'd be amazed to see how much shared service goes on in Genesee County. That's another one of my pet peeves. You'll hear politicians, well, you need to share more services. They have no idea how much is going on at the local level. Our highway guys are constantly sharing with, with everybody. Uh, other, we're sharing equipment back and forth, manpower. Perfect example, uh, the new Ellicott Trail that we put in that I was a part of was a city, town, um, collaborative. Uh, we got the county to come in and do some work at the Whip Park. And if you haven't walked to the Ellicott Trail when the weather's nice again, go out and check it out. It is awesome. There are ages of all kinds on there, all walks of life. Um, very proud of that. And again, that was one of those things that took some arrows early on 
oh, this is a waste of taxpayer money. Nobody's going to walk on it, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I think it's one of the, the nicest assets we have, and I, I'm very proud to be part of that project. Anything else we have to answer? I just have a comment on the collaboration I think in this county is fantastic. And as far as the criminal justice system, our criminal justice advisory council is the envy of other counties. They can't imagine that we have all the people that sit at one table monthly. Well, right now we're uh, doing it virtually, but that come together at one table to discuss the criminal justice system from all the treatment agencies, uh, the judges, the district attorney, public defender, every faction. And we are the envy of other counties because of that. I agree. And I've heard that for, you know, from our EDC that, that gets a lot of kudos from other counties to, you know, our town of Batavia court does a very good job there. You know, I hear a lot of things when I say I'm from Genesee County and you're statewide, you know, you don't get that, oh, you're a bunch of bumpkins look, you know, you, oh, I, I heard you guys did this. I heard you guys did that. And the other thing that I know, I know you guys are discovering through leadership Genesee is, there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge here. It's amazing. We can compete with anybody. I mean, when I see what some of the small businesses are doing, when I see the background of some of the people that serve on our boards, I'm always impressed. And I've lived here all my life with, you know, a, a few years out of college and things like that. I learn something new all the time about what's going on, who's doing things, companies I hadn't heard of, people I hadn't met that you know, just have done tremendous things and, and worked on national scale and a global scale. Um, so we, we've got good people here. And look, let's face it, it's New York State. The taxes are terrible. The weather's not great. You're here because you want to be here. You're here because you like the people. You like your family. You know, we've, we've got a great region. We get to Buffalo and Rochester, up to Toronto, down to New York City, all very easily. Um, you know, we've got three throughway exits. we got Darien Lake. We've got Batavia Downs. We've got a lot going for us. Um, you know, you don't really have to leave if you don't want to. We got Target and Walmart. I mean, if you want to go to a mall, I don't know, anybody still do that anymore. Um, you, you know, you can hop down the throughway and, and be there pretty quickly. But, um, you know, I, I take pride in this community. I take, you know, Leadership Genesee does a, a great job. We've sent a bunch of people through the town. It just really opens your eyes to how much is out there and how much this county has to offer. Anything else? You guys get your audio video. Problem solved, Peggy. Chad, I just want. Chad, I just wanted to um, tell you not to feel bad about attendance at your town board meetings because <laughs> nobody comes to school board meetings either, unless you are doing something with athletics. I, you know, I will. I've said that I have friends that are on school boards. And I'm like, what are you doing to yourself? I mean, the town is one thing. The school, the position that schools are in, with what the state does. And the thing that drives me nuts is, you know, the amount of money that we spend and the results that we get. And that's not, you know, that's more of a reflection, I think, statewide. Um, but, you know, City of Batavia School District spends $50 million a year. It's a million dollars a week. You know, in the, in, in, in the town, we're spending 10000 You know, the amount of money we invest in education, we have great local schools, great local teachers. But statewide, you know, we're spending the most per student and we're like in the middle of the pack, which drives me nuts. And I'll be honest, I think that's probably, in my opinion, that starts at home. That's a lack of parents that are involved. And I think teachers uh, have the same job that, that uh, police have nowadays. You know, you're not just a teacher, you're a social service worker, you know, you're a babysitter. There's just so much we expect them to do. Obviously, part of that's because people are busier. And part of it's just because, you know what, you got to do your job, man. You got to take care of your kids, your family, go to work, go to school and do those sorts of things. So uh, it's, I, I would not want to be in a school board. <laughs> you guys have so much little wiggle room of what you can do. I'm going to hop off and go to a call. Any last minute questions? Thanks very much for um, sharing your time with us this morning. We appreciate it. Happy to do it. Hope I didn't put any to sleep and uh, hope I covered enough to, to give you something to think about. Oh, Chad, you're always very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I don't even have a beer in me yet. Catch me about four o'clock at Lacey's. <laughs> okay. All right. You take care. Right. Bye. Good luck, LG. Thank have a good you. year. Thank you. Yvonne, can we do it? We can try again.
I just don't want to lose Wi-Fi. Okay. Let me see. Let's give it a shot. Let's try. I'm going to keep my volume on so you guys can let me know if you can hear it. I don't know why it's not playing the volume for you. Can you hear them? Nope. Now? No. I don't know why it's not. I don't know why it's not playing the volume. Are you listening through headphones? That might be. I just unplugged the headphones. Oh. Um, yeah. You know, let me, I thought of that, but let me try. <clears throat> We'll give it one more try. If not, then we'll have some discussion. And I've got some things to share with you all. Under share screen, is there a share audio button? Um, let me, did I lose you again? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought I lost my fight again. Anything? No, under share screen, there's no share audio. It's just share either one per, one participant at a time can share or, you know, so I don't think. We can just share the link. All right, we'll do that. Oh, that stinks, sorry, everyone. Just, it it just doesn't stink. <laughs> It does, because you did a really nice job, and your dad did a nice job. So if you want to really learn the ins and outs of the volunteer fire department that has men and women um, <laughs> working in it and, and fighting the fires, then they are firefighters. They are firefighters. That's correct. Then please, um, we'll send the link. Please watch that. It's about 22 minutes long. Sarah, you did a wonderful job. You asked great questions and your dad did a great job. So thank you. Um, so let's have an open discussion about um, civic responsibility because that's really what today is all about. Um, so you can unmute yourself and share your thoughts of how you think um, would be a good way for you to be civically responsible. You know, what are some ways that you have been or what are some ways that you would like to be more civically responsible? What does that just mean to you? This is your chance to talk amongst yourselves. I will unmute you if you don't unmute yourselves. <laughs> I'll jump I in. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Teresa. Okay. Um, I just think with the, um, you know, kind of the comments about people not coming to you know, village board, town board, all of those meetings, I think it's really important to, um, you know, as our homework was to, to try and swing into those once in a while, um, even if you don't have anything to say, because, you, you know, I, I've heard people say all politics is local. And I agree with that. I think the things that affect your day to day life, um, like the, the most consistently and the most importantly, they're coming from the town and the county level government. And I think sometimes people get a little bit intimidated and, um, you know, obviously any present or recently present company excluded, I think that, you know, there are some elected officials that kind of use that to their advantage. And, um, you know, they forget that they work for us. And I think it's really important that we don't forget that they work for us. So, um, it's really easy to, to go to a town or village or, or county meeting, um, especially now with Zoom, if you're not comfortable going in per person, a lot of them are offered via Zoom link. So even if, you know, you just wanted to kind of get a feel for it, you can do it from the safety of your home on your couch and your jammies, whatever the case may be. But I think that it's really important that people, um, in, involve themselves in that, even if you know running for public office or being on a committee is not something that you know they're they're interested in or that fits in with their life. Um, I think that you know the elected officials that really uh, want to do right by their community want your input and want your feedback. And like you said, people aren't mind readers, and I think that we can really help our community just by letting our voices be heard. Awesome! 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 Who else? Who else would like to share? 
So I just want to oh. Really quick. I'll go quick, Steve. No, it's okay. You can even just go to your town's website and I bet they have an agenda posted and you can see, oh, what the heck is this? And then you go and you log in. You don't even have to have pants on. You just log in and you listen to what they say and you might actually get hooked. And that's kind of what happened to me. Now I, I go to all these meetings on Zoom. I just sit here. It's great. Just do it. Are you advocating not wearing pants? <laughs> that's none of my business. Oh, okay. I just want to check. Just I don't have a position on that. Okay. <laughs> so my, my idea of civic responsibility, while I'm a, I'm a public servant, um, and I chose this as my career field, I started off as a volunteer firefighter um, because I thought it was a pretty cool thing to do. And uh, what got me interested in the volunteer fire service is uh, my time in the Boy Scouts. And I was giving uh, to my community and I'm a very proud Eagle Scout and uh, people kind of laugh at me. Stand by. Oh, that is awesome. In my office, Aww. I carry my Eagle Scout flag from 1982 and uh, I try to encourage every Boy Scout and, and now with the allowance of, of, of females into the program to, you know, we call it trail the Eagle climbing all the time. And that's what hooked me into civic uh, responsibility or duty. And um, <clears throat> I liked it so much um, that I wanted to, to make a career out of it. Uh, you know, even though I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, the private sector just, it wasn't for me. It, it, was, it was great money. Um, I was working up at a nuclear power plant. Um, I was making close to $100,000 34 years ago, and I left it all to start off as a career firefighter at $21,000. And it was the best decision I ever made. To me, civic, res civic responsibility means taking ownership in your community, uh, it, whether it's be it village, town, city, county level, because you don't have a right to complain. I'm gonna say some, I'm gonna use a derogatory term or, you can't bitch, moan, complain, whine, cry if you're not involved. If you're not involved, then shut your mouth. And, and, and there's so many ways and that they, we, we discussed today about being involved. And one of the basic, as Sarah just said, I would recommend wearing pants to a meeting is to, to go to a meeting, it is to sit there. Because there's so many people, I, I have to go to two council meetings every, every uh, month. And then countless other meetings that because of where I sit on different uh, boards or positions, there are people that'll come to a city council meeting and they just sit there like, oh, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know this. This is your money. This is your, your services, your tax dollars, your uh, everything that makes your life better. Um, you know, so to me, so, uh, civic duty is having a responsibility to be engaged, whether it is a full engagement, a partial engagement, a minimal engagement. I'll stop my pontificating now. That's okay. You can pontificate. <laughs> Thanks. I, I think one way it comes through, and I, I kind of realized through this, so people didn't know, my past life, I was a news reporter. And mm -hmm. even as uh, poorly as we were paid, I realized now I was, I was probably the person who had the most in financial incentive to be at a meeting. But... Um, when I moved into Batavia about a year ago now, you know, my neighbor would ask me like, okay, so what is this thing in the community? And, and I would, you know, really have a good sense of that. And that was just from being at meetings for, you know, two times a month for, every, you know, for three or four years. And, and I think that's the way that you get to civics without having to run for something. I, I, I have no desire to, you know, run for political office, but if you're that person for your neighbors, that can make a big difference because you know they're they're busier than than even you know the person who's involved is. Um, so I I think that's probably the biggest benefit, and I'm sure Sarah you you probably helped out people as well. Yeah, for me, I want I hear these crazy things, and I want to know is that true or not. So you got to go to the source and find out. So I sit in on these meetings so I can explain, hey, that's not the whole story. That's only part of it. Or that that's not what's going on. This is what's going on. Because you hear something crazy and it's you tell 17 people, but you hear the truth. You got to, you know, drive it home. 
And I like to have the facts and I like to have, well, this is how I heard it instead of, well, so-and-so's grandma's aunt said this. You know, that, that's a really good point. And Jim, what you're saying, it really um, hits home. Uh, you know, recently I was in a meeting and um, someone said something that they had read in the paper. Now, no offense. It was a, it wasn't a letter to the editor. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, an actual article by a newspaper person, by a reporter. And so they took that to be the truth. And it wasn't the whole story because I happen to know a little bit about the background. So, you know, I got a little adamant, but, but the point was, especially in public service and public affairs, if you're not willing to look for both sides of the issue, and by the way, this is one of Leadership Genesee's core values, that is knowing both sides of an issue. It, it really is. If you're not willing to do that, then honestly, be quiet. Keep, keep those opinions to yourself. And please, 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 social media is a, is a, it can be a wonderful place to keep connected. connected. It can be a horrible place to uh, spread nonsense. So please be careful, especially as a Leadership Genesee graduate, alumnus, participant, and as a leader in the community in your own rights, please be careful about what you say. Um, I share a lot. I don't always say a lot. I share because I, I think, well, this is kind of interesting. Maybe somebody else will want to hear it. I'm honestly starting to wane out of Facebook and out of social media. I'm starting to think, you know, maybe the effects of social media is not so great. Uh, and maybe we just need to talk to each other again. I love, as much as I don't like Zoom, I love Zoom, if that makes any sense, because we're, we're able to connect very easily together. And I think that that's kind of cool. So um, it's a core value of Leadership Genesee. And I hope you remember that as you, you know, do your day-to-day -day tasks. So, all right, that's me. Any, who else would like to share? Peggy, I'll say that I appreciate the opportunities from the tidbits, because I think that uh, where we spend our time outside of our jobs is usually an intersection between what we're passionate about and where we see a need. At least that's kind of the way I look at it. And a lot of times we don't see needs. Um, social media used to be a little more informational and now it's a little more entertainment. And um, so I think that communication opportunities like the tidbits are um, more important that way now and alert us to needs like, you know, the Matt Landers Clinic um, I think that that stuff is really critical for us, especially now when we get into silos in the middle of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just jump in there, please don't hesitate to send us anything for tidbits because they used to be, we used to get so much more information from alumni. Um, and it's, it's, I know that everything has changed, but um, send it to us. We'll, we'll get it in if, if we can. You know, we, we really tried to make tidbits um, not so much about, uh, it, we, we, we really try to focus on the nonprofit world and volunteer activities that are necessary, job openings that maybe a, almost any job opening that is sent to us, we try to send out. So, um, you know, those areas of the community that really need help are, please share that with us. And, you know, that's why I love tidbits. We've been doing it for a long time and I think it's been working very well. So, who else? Anyone else wanna give it a go? Charity's busy. She's disinfecting. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah. John, how are you doing, John Fiscus in Oakfield? How's Oakfield doing? We're doing we're doing great. I'm um, sorry I was late to the to the meeting. Had some things to take care of this morning. Um, okay, no, you don't have to apologize. Yeah, we're uh, we're surviving every day. Um, you know, we're just following the Cuomo's guidance and uh, just keeping our fingers crossed that uh, um, you know supporting the notion that the schools are safe for kids to be at, and um, we're just we're just trying to stay open. So we're. We're good. It's it's been tough. Um, we're waiting to see over the next month with the holiday season how that affects, you know, the the region's you know COVID rates. But 
-hmm. I think within our, within our campus, um, we're good. So. Good. Nice to hear. Good, good, good. Um, just to let you know, Steve Hawley was supposed to be uh, one of our in-person speakers. So I am going to reach out to him today and see if he would like to do a Zoom with the class as well. So stay tuned for that information. That may come at any time. Who knows? It would depend on his schedule. So if you're interested, we'll have Steve Hawley on too, so you can have a state representative. We'll do that. Anybody else want to chit chat? What about public meetings? We asked you to attend a public meeting. I know many of you do that regularly for your jobs, uh, but what about those that don't regularly attend public meetings? Did you, and what did you get out of it? What did you see? So, I grew up in Newstead out in Erie County. And for as long as I can remember, my dad has always been on the town planning board. However, I have never gone to a meeting. I see his packet that comes home, you know, various thicknesses that he has to read before he goes to his meetings. Um, but see you, Ned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, never went to one. So with this, I'm like, okay. You know, I, I'm out here and living in Henrietta, so I'm like, okay, got to look at these, you know, board meetings. So I went to, well, Zoomed my own planning board meeting. So that was really neat. Like the planning board meeting that I went to, um, most of the session was dedicated to a private citizen trying to build a house on property he owns. And it, I guess, tensions with him and his neighbors have been boiling for a little bit because he went on just this this whole not not quite a rant but just a, a long stream of this is all the background information <laughs> um because I guess the board had gotten some notifications in writing that like oh we're against this and they're just like mm, we have some flags we need to address um so that was kind of entertaining um Otherwise, it was just a lot of, you know, more extensions for building things. And I'm just, it's, it's interesting to see what my dad's doing like every other week or once a month, I forget what it is in Newstead. Um, and just, you know, realizing that there are the, the, actually the town planning board meeting is a nice place to see what's going on because it looks like there's going to be a Burger King going in, which I'm really excited about. Um, <laughs> But I remember my dad talking about when the Tim Hortons went in or was going to go in in Newstead at like Route 5 and 93, which is the only place we get congestion in the town. <laughs> um, and they were concerned about, you know, a drive through line. Like I remember all these little bits and pieces and it's just interesting to have everything kind of coagulate and come together. Sure. So, I'll be interested to start attending more meetings because like Sarah says, I can attend by Zoom and I don't necessarily have to look great from like, you know, here down. So <laughs> You're cracking me up. <laughs> awesome. Who else? Anyone else that has never attended a public meeting? Can I just add something? Please. Do you, do you mind, Peggy? No. Um, so as I participated in Leadership Genesee last year, I learned a lot about the community that I wasn't aware of. And I just want to encourage this year's participants to, if something from this year sticks out to you, make an effort to do something different moving forward. So if today encouraged you to check something out, try something different, do it. Even if it's just that one thing, let that happen. Like don't push it to the back burner do it and just try it. If it doesn't work for you, fine, that's fine. But I think the whole purpose of Leadership Genesee is to go outside your comfort zone, do something different and let it impact you and then let that ripple out to impact others. And I think when we hear talk about, you know, apathy in the community, it has to start some, we, the change has to start somewhere. And I think it starts with ourselves in our homes, in our communities, in our job, and we need to start making that change. So if Leadership Genesee has encouraged you through your participation to try something, do it and 
let the ripple effects go. And I think that that's how we start change and, and do something different for our communities and the communities that you live in and work in. So that's just my little thing. That's a little, it's, not, it's a big thing. Awesome. So what, what happens with that little bubble in the water and the ripple, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And those spheres of influence start to grow. And you not only can influence others positively, but they can influence you. So it's, it's a, it's a good thing. Anyone don't else? Hesitate. Don't hesitate to do it. You know, sometimes we double think and triple think ourselves and then we end up not doing something. And sometimes you have to force yourself to do it. And every time I've forced myself to do something, I've felt so much gratification and satisfaction from doing it. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with Sarah. Just if you're thinking of trying something, try it. If any of you know Tim Hens, ask him someday his philosophy about comfort versus progress. We had a speaker, John Engels, a long time ago, um, who is a, a leadership coach for businesses that are family owned. So families, members working together. And he spoke to the, to the group about leadership. And one of his main points is that um, we can all be comfortable but progress may be messy and not comfortable, but it, it's what catapults you forward. So uh, especially with today's learning outcome of being visionary and, and future oriented, you know, sometimes things are not comfortable and you do have to force yourself in it. And, you know, you, you may not feel great about it in the beginning, but then you look back and you think, wow, I, I am so glad I didn't, you know, pass that by. I am so glad I tried that. Um, my life would be so different if I hadn't given Leadership Genesee a shot. I knew this was the right thing to do. And every single class, every person that I've met and has touched my life, I've grown probably more than anybody in the classes have grown. So um, it's awful. It's awfully great. So I have decided that when I retire, when I do, I'm going to start a business where I can be the um, operator that says, Yes, may I help you? Because I know a lot about a little, no, I know a little about a lot. So I'll be that like little center um, operator that can say, to point you in the direction that you need to go in. So that'll be my own little business. <laughs> I'll have to call myself something kind of cute. I don't know what yet. So <laughs> um, the one thing I do want to talk about, and we'll send this out in an email so that everybody hears it, is that um, each year at graduation, and I don't know when that'll be because, you know, we're hoping for January, but we don't know what's going to happen. So just stay flexible with us. The class, we asked the class to vote for a class speaker that will speak at graduation uh, about for, you know, 15, 10 to 15 minute speech about your year and, and who you can, uh, someone that can really represent the journey for all of you. So I need you to start thinking about that. We'll probably do some kind of an email vote. Um, it's not a, oh, so-and-so should do it. It's a, it's a private vote so that everyone has a shot at being heard on this. So just think about it. Um, we are still trying to work on having an in-person graduation, um, but it will depend on the COVID numbers and what happens. But you know what? We'll wait till we can be together because I know that's what you all want to do. Um, we really want to have closing retreat together. Um, next week is Education and lead, uh, Lifelong Learning Day, and we've got some cool things planned. And I think you're really going to enjoy the speakers that we've got. You've got three superintendents in the class, so you're very lucky. <clears throat> However, we're going to be talking to some other people from other levels. So I think you're going to enjoy next week. Um, Sue, do you have anything else that you would like to add? No. <laughs> short and simple thank you for that short and simple I just want to say that Charity put something in the chat that I'm going to copy and send to everybody I can't read it out loud because I'll cry but it's awesome about ripples thank you Charity for sharing that oh yeah I can send the full poem if you would like I can. I, I would can love her. her I have a poster in my office that's um, it's a pebble and it's got the ripples of water and when I moved from one office to another, the people that were helping me move um, dropped something against it. And so the, the plastic was a, a poster from a, one of those sh um, motivational shops. The plastic cracked and I decided to leave it because even though it looked different, 
it was still motivating to me because it forced me to look at it differently. I kind of thought that was cool. So anyway, so I would like to thank Shelly. Thank you for staying on and listening. Um, I think Matt had to go, but thank you so much. Thank you to Chad. He's always entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you to Sue and the design team of Kitty Martin, Dave Miller, Paul Siskowski couldn't join us today, but he helped us a lot, uh, and Sarah Welker and Kathy Uli. So I will send you kind of a little mini agenda so you have uh, the people's names uh, that we did. Uh, Yvonne will send out um, the contact information for them. And if you have any other comments, concerns, questions, please send them to us. Thank you so much for coming today. It was great to see everyone. Um, Eric, you were very entertaining. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just want you to know. A couple of times, all I could see was the back of your phone, but that was entertaining too. <laughs> so um, thanks everybody. Um, so good to see you. So have a great week and I'll see you next week. <laughs>